recording, but yeah, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, so welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, or whatever time zone you are in. Uh, my name is Christoph Sandner. I am senior principal here at Infineon uh, Technologies Austria in the southern part of Austria. So it's a beautiful area to do vacations. Today is the sun is shining, so it would be better to be at the lake, but I'm very happy to be with you here today for the kickoff of, of this boot camp uh, for analog generators. I'm the program owner of uh, the analog generator program at Infineon, so we are investing here uh, quite some, some effort into bringing the whole idea to life. And in this talk today, in roughly one hour, I, I want to explain you what are our thoughts about analog circuit generators and uh, what we believe are, is, is important to get the whole thing running. And one part of the whole story is the bootcamp that is going on right now, uh, which I'm, I'm very grateful for Miriana to organize all this because that's, that's a hell of an effort, I'm sure. So I'm very happy that we have this now come to life. And so, yeah, let's get started with an overview about Unlock IC design, generator based. So the basic idea, Anagen, so Anagen is, is the name of our internal program, uh, whatever name you want to, to take. The basic idea is usually the same. You want to generate uh, reconfigurable building blocks like it's indicated here with the 3D printer. You print your, your LEGO devices, so some kind of standardization we believe is needed. Like here, the distance of the dots to connect the pieces later together, the interfaces, that's really important. You then collect these uh, custom-made blocks into a reuse database. So also reuse is something that is fostered then if you do that. And then finally, hopefully you can do a much faster and more efficient tape out. Um, over the last years, we have seen there, is, there are a lot of obstacles, of course, and there's maybe also some, some reasons why it's not, not broadly used today. But already Albert Einstein made the same experience that, yeah, something seems to be impossible. In the end, they become reality. <clears throat> Unlock generators are not a new idea. So already 30 years ago, there was a, a paper in the Journal of Solid State Circuits. You see some famous names here like Eric Vito, probably this rings a bell. Uh, main author here is Mark de Graube, and they, they developed at uh, EPFL, to my knowledge, an interactive design tool for analog CMOS circuits. So that's exactly what we also target today. You see here, they, they, they had a piece of code, and in this example, uh, you, you could uh, program a voltage reference, and the tool did some dimensioning tasks for you, and also created, in the end, a layout. So that was really nice. And there was also then follow-up article in IEEE Spectrum. And yeah, basic idea you see here, you take design specs, you have a library of, of unsized circuit schematics. The user selects and specifies what, what he, he or she needs. Then you take simplified analysis equations for your specific circuit and uh, you create a solution, you check by simulation if the result is, is okay, and if not, then you need to tweak around with your specifications or with your circuit dimensions, and in the end, you get a sized circuit schematic. Um, I had the honor to analyze this tool in the 90s when I was a student at, at Siemens at that time in Munich. You see on the right side the screenshot of, of, yeah, of, of, the, of the screen, it had a nice GUI. Um, you could end the things, you, you got a layout out of it, but in the end, it turned out not to be successful. There might be several reasons, but I believe that the main reason also at Siemens, uh, they did not use it in the end, was it was it simply was not flexible enough. It was able to create your standard op-amp, but uh, the effort to get the standard op-amp was in the same order, even higher than 
uh, taking an, an experienced unlock designer. So now let's do a time jump three years back roughly or four or five years mean, uh, meanwhile. <clears throat> there came Berkeley besides others with a very similar idea. Uh, they call it the Berkeley Unlock Generator and we've had a first look to that and said, yeah, this looks promising. So what they do is the basic idea, I believe, stays more or less the same. You have schematic templates. They are parameterizable. Uh, you can size them by code. Layout is done by generator script. And in the end, if you do everything right, you get a process portable design. It's DOC and LVS clean and you can also adapt uh, the circuit topology within some boundaries like you see in this example. You can create a, a current mode logic driver in, in the left example for global foundries 40 nanometer with, with having three taps, so three outputs. And on the right side for different technology flavor with having only two, two outputs, so that's very nice and configurable. Maybe the biggest difference here is it's it's a fully programmatic uh, approach, so it's quite some effort for the students or the, the guy who is using it to create the circuitry and also get the result that he or she wants in the end. <clears throat> uh, Berkeley is still uh, following this approach and also bringing it uh, to the students in the classes, so they have a special tape out class. Uh, in place. They did it last year uh, first time and they continue now with this and that's uh, really impressive what students can do with such kind of generators. So they also have a digital generator approach um, that students can really do a tape out within one year. So why do we go this direction at all? It's quite simple. Analog design and layout this is very often a bottleneck in, in terms of design effort. Digital is already optimized uh, by, by quite some extent, but analog is not. Uh, this picture I found in a paper from Rutenbar 2010, so it's also known since several years that we have to improve here. <clears throat> and when going to the, uh, to the next technology node, the effort usually increases roughly by 2x. That's an estimate by Boa Nikolic, but uh, I would confirm this from what, what we see here. It gets more and more expensive to develop uh, analog chips. And one other learning from this graph, you see big chunk is uh, contributed to verification, so it does not help to only optimize or automatize uh, unlock design, you also need to include verification. It's an essential part. Another reason is time to market and R&D costs. So if you look to a classical IP development timeline, so if you develop an, an initial IP building block, like you develop a voltage regulator, takes some time, then sometimes you do a der derivative or quite often, you do another derivative and then sooner or later you need, to, you need to do a design package transfer of your initial IP and this all usually goes in, in a serious way <coughs> over time. Now if you did the same thing with an unlock generator based development style, the timeline would look different. So the initial IP development usually takes longer because you add some coding overhead on top of all the things you anyhow have to do. But once you have done this properly with the, with each follow up IP, with each derivative, you should be able to be much faster. So in the end, and even design package transfer should be really simple and fast. So in the end, we believe that with this approach, you, you can gain time to market and, and save R&D cost by this. However, this is only true if you think uh, in, in platforms and if you have a good roadmap in place for your IP building blocks, so you need to plan ahead as good as you can or the more the better uh, to make uh, get most benefit out of this approach. It does not help if you just code one IP and then yeah, you go to another IP because then the coding overhead uh, will, will eat up all your benefits. 
And last reason why we believe it makes sense to go in this direction, it's also for the engineers. It would help to focus on the essential tasks. So all the standard tasks should be, we should be able to automate because they are standard. And usually these things are boring. So if you ask any, if I ask any of my designers, do you want to do a, a design porting from 28 to 22 nanometer? Then yeah, <laughs> there is not much enthusiasm behind. But if I ask, yeah, do you want to develop the, the, the next Bluetooth front end? Yeah, this is then a cool thing. And yeah, we hope by this approach that people get more time to spend time on essential tasks. You have already seen since 30 years, we, there are ideas to do that. And why, why is it not broadly used today? And there was an interesting talk by El Adalon, professor at Berkeley at, at last year's SCIRC. And I, I took some of, of his pictures here because I really like them. Um, so custom analog designers we, we have seen have been quite resistant quite often to this style of automation. Um, and here are some reasons why, partly I took this again from Elad. So one reason is there are a lot of ways to get your design and layout wrong. So you, you start with something and then yeah, the layout does not really look, look nice and then the, the, uh, an experienced layout comes and says, yeah, I can do this much, much faster and more efficient because you, you spend a lot of time then uh, constraining what you're doing. And here you really have to find a smart way um, to, to overcome this, this obstacle. Another reason, yeah, sim very simple reason, especially, especially the, the, maybe the elder analog designers, they don't like coding. <clears throat> so you might think, okay, then just offer the classical analog designer a GUI approach. And this is um, doable like you've seen 30 years ago, but there are even tools or, or EDA providers on the market today that offer you GUIs or, or startup companies that offer you IP development based on a GUI where you end, just enter the properties of an op -amp or any building block and then you click a button and you get your, your IP. I do not fully believe in, in this story um, because at least for, for, for our company, it doesn't make sense because they are quite inflexible and it's a lot of effort to maintain and build such a GUI. So I just believe this makes sense for, for certain tasks to improve the usability, especially in layout. You, we will need more, more graphical support here, but uh, it's, it's not a, a standalone solution that, that solves everything. So I believe more in the, in the coding approach. And Another thing to consider is that it's, it's not really, it, it's not such a task to learn Python. Students today learn Python already at, at university or C++, whatever language you want to use. So the coding then is, is not the real problem, but the problem is to force yourself, think about how, how to document and that the procedure, how you came to a certain uh, circuit and a, a cert certain a result that you want to achieve in a particular design. And yeah, if you make yourself aware of that, then it also looks looks different, the effort that you spend into coding. And last not least, what, what we have seen over the last years, today the, the entry hurdle is simply too high for, for, for most people. First, there are a lot of choices available, different approaches from different universities or, or even companies, um, some, just some named here. And usually it's, it's the installation is tricky, so it's really hard to get started. Uh, if you install back in your environment, there are tools missing where you have different tools for verification and so on. The, you need a link to a PDK, you need to get a PDK. So this is a real threat today to start get started with using analog generators. Um, yeah, just a quick picture about the mindset change that is needed. We need to learn new skills, so 
I believe we need people that are skilled in both analog design and coding. And as already mentioned, some people do not like that. On the other hand, I believe this, this can be solved or what, what I see is that especially young engineers are very open to this approach um, and we still, I mean, we, we will not do all the unlock design and layout uh, within the next 10 years with these generators. This will not happen. So we will both, both of these people will still coexist over the next years. So will these generators be adopted? Let's see what we at Infineon did so far. And I have a quick video. I hope this is working. Can you see it? Before yes. I start it? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Let's go. Let's try it. I, I, I did not try this before. Yeah, there is no audio. Uh, should it be? Maybe you need to. Uh, is there any audio? Yes, there is audio. Yeah. But we, we don't hear it. Ah. So okay. maybe. Um, Interesting. Um, this is. My background. Be honest. Yeah, to be honest. I think if you, if you start the sharing, there is a, a, a checkbox somewhere where you can enable the audio. And let yes, me you're right. I share the whole screen. No, oh, I don't get an option. Um, if I click the, the share button on top, I see share content and there is a small slider with include computer sound. OK, I give it a last try. Stop sharing. So for, for, for me, it is the window where you can select a uh, full screen or, or just a specific uh, window. Input system okay. audio. Ah, now I have seen it. OK, thanks. Well, it's going to be your voice, Christoph. You could have, you know, done it <laughs> again. OK. <laughs> yeah, so I'll try it again. Stop immediately if if it or if it does not work then let's let's keep it running because it's just one minute um and if it does not work i will share the video later on mm -hmm. thanks analog circuit design today still involves several time consuming manual steps with boring design tasks like technology porting or stressful late design changes from schematic entry over layout to verification so isn't it time for a change meet anagen the analog generator program with Anagen, you automize your workflow. The complete design procedure is captured into code, from requirements to documentation. Using Anagen, you can achieve same area and performance with up to 50% effort reduction. This is proven on three different products and the pilot flow is available. Once set up, you can create a whole IP family with minimum effort, handle late spec changes, quickly port to new technologies and apply any kind of optimization algorithms. It allows our design engineers to focus on essential tasks. We see huge potential for Infineon to reduce time to market by up to 5x and millions of savings over the next 10 years. Sounds exciting? Talk to us. Meet the Anagen team under go to slash Anagen. Did it work great. this time? Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Great. <laughs> Keep <Okay>. going. <laughs> okay, so you see this. Um, I, I also spent some effort in internal marketing inside Infineon because 
yeah, also w within our company, I have to be very open. It's yeah, there are people who believe in this story and people who don't believe. And in the end, if if we are successful with this approach, um, yeah, we will all know within an, just a few years from now. Nobody can tell if this time we are uh, successful. But I I believe in it. So going a bit more in detail, what what do we do here when developing an unlock IP design? So if you look on how, what are the design steps you need to do today? You take the requirements or your specification, then you, you, you go into concept and design work, you choose a certain topology for, your, for fulfilling these requirements, you do a first dimensioning, um, you do a first uh, pre-layout uh, verification, probably some running some simulations or even some, some MATLAB code to dimension it. Then you do layouts, then you do pre and post, uh, yeah, pre-silicon verification based on layout. And then you can start delivering this IP to your top level. So you need to involve different engineers here. Uh, it's an entirely custom process if you talk about analog and usually for a typical building block, it's uh, the timeline is about a few weeks to some months. Now, if you look on how would you do this in an unlock generator based design flow, it, the starting point and the end is, is different, but in between now we change the way we work because all design and layout and verification procedures are captured into Python code, Python or C++. And this allows to apply automation on top. Once you have your code, you can apply automation. And this is the game changer here. It is effort, definitely effort to, to, do, to take this step, but once you do it, you gain by applying automation and on top you can also, of course, then later apply any kind of AI tools if, if you have a smart idea how to do that, or you can apply optimization algorithms uh, in an automatic way. And this is the innovation on a fundamental approach to unlock design and yeah, you can then gain time to market and you also, uh, it's a scalable approach uh, especially if you have building blocks that you need in different flavors uh, for, for the same chip or for different products or then later port it to different technologies. And uh, these slides are from Federico. He did a uh, talk here or he had a paper at the CLCC last year where you can also find details uh, on this approach. <clears throat> so the use case here was uh, a uh, generator for a low dropout regulator, voltage regulator, uh, where he provided or he developed one uh, LDO generator, uh, which can support five different flavors of, of this uh, voltage regulator. So three of them are, you could say, more or less standard, but providing different output currents. One is optimized towards uh, target, targeting low noise operation and uh, another one is uh, targeted for minimum area. And all this based on the same code. And in the end, we also did com com comparison for, for one of these with a full custom layout. And is, as you can see here, for this example, there was, we achieved the same area and performance for, for the same, fulfilling the same requirements, uh, but in the end uh, achieving 50% effort reduction. Um, there is a big debate, or we are still learning on what are good IP building blocks where you can apply this, where you really can achieve same area. <coughs> Um, sometimes you even achieve less area, especially if if the initial design from the which was custom made was quick and dirty um, and not fully optimized. Then, if you run optimization algorithms in the automated approach, then you you gain here. On the other hand, we also have examples where the, the area afterwards is, is larger. So um, 
yeah, this is still a learning phase here. And the more opti optimized you want your layout to get, the more effort you need to spend here in the generator code for the layout. So this you should be aware. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit, talking about methodology. So I mentioned in the beginning, one big entry hurdle today is that it's very difficult to, to get started with unlock generators because yeah, usually they were developed at universities and um, they work work nicely in, in their own environment, but uh, it's, it's quite some effort to port them in a different environment. So over the last months, we spent a lot of thoughts here out. Why is this the case and how, how can we improve that? And um, especially now in this bootcamp, um, we want to present you uh, a lot of our ideas and we, we we are willing to share these ideas with you because we believe this is crucial also to be in the end successful uh, and this can only be done together. And when thinking about methodology, what is the situation today? <clears throat> so for, if you do manual IP development, full custom way, then typically you have this stack of, of uh, things in place. You have EDA tools that you use. Uh, you have then a certain way how to store your data. And on the bottom, you, you have the technology data or, or design package that you use to do your design in a specific technology. So this is what is relevant for manual <coughs> IP development for Unlock. Now, if you ask a methodology engineer, uh, what does change now if we go switch to an unagen approach, then for this engineer, this is an evolution because, yeah, if if you look to the to the stack that is drawn here, there there are certain things that come on top. So you need an API, so an in kind of interface towards the EDA tools that you have in place. Um, you add further tools and codes on top and yeah, so it's it's not very sophisticated for a methodology engineer. For an IP design layout engineer, it's different because here it's it's a revolution. It's a different disruptive change. You do not no, no longer draw your stuff, your schematic in, in, in Cadence, for example, or you do not draw your layout there, but you have to start coding. And this is a big change on this side. And methodology engineers, it's it's a bit easier to, to think the way what is needed here. And that's uh, also why we also involve more and more software engineers into improving the methodology because, I mean, they are the experts. And as an <coughs> electric engineer, I mean, you, you learn how to code Python and, and use Python and C++, but there's a lot more behind to get uh, a, a good structure uh, to have an efficient usage of your methodology, not only initially, but over long time, inclusive, uh, including sustaining. So I talked a lot about uh, what, what we did already. Uh, here you see our vision, so this is where we want to get. In 2025, and there is not much time to go, I, I wrote this down in 2019, I think. So 2025, we have an established user group for unlock generators. To enable this idea of getting faster time to market and reduce r &D. And some, some more uh, explanation below. So we like to call it now the unlock soft macro approach. So like in digital, you have a digital soft macros where you deliver RTL code plus some constraints and scripts how to how to run it. Here we can do something very similar and deliver in the future unlock soft macros. Uh, as already mentioned several times, we believe programmatic approach like back started to do it is the right way to go. We want to involve 
international universities, research institutes, companies, and that's also exactly why we we also sub fully support this bootcamp here <clears throat> um, to to avoid island solutions where where yeah in the end it's really tricky to use them. Uh, training documentation, student classes shall be in place. Uh, in the end, of course, everybody wants to have a huge library of building blocks, uh, which is well documented. And finally, last not least, uh, standardization, I believe, of, of the framework core, so of the interfaces at least. This is really key, and this is where we lack today, and this is also where I believe this mosaic framework that we have put together now can be a big help to achieve this goal. <clears throat> um, coming back to methodology, this mosaic framework, I took this slide from Florian. He will go into much more detail tomorrow, but just as a teaser for you that, that you already see what, what ex uh, you can expect. <clears throat> so he will explain you in, in much better than I could um, how all these uh, things come together to to get in the end an, an efficient uh, methodology or framework that you can work together. So have all the tools, uh, tasks, PDKs, uh, and much more uh, working together. And another quick preview about this framework. I will not go into detail now here, but as you can see, there is uh, a lot of thoughts have been spent already in how such a framework should look like. Uh, you need some some common common containers for some some basic stuff like how, how do you install the, 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 the modules? How, how do you handle dependency management? Um, things like that and how to in the end how to connect your design, where to store your data and all. So to allow the designer in the end to have an efficient um, uh, yeah, execution of each design task. So to conclude, I fully believe in the end it will pay off if you follow this, this path. So usage of generators will reduce time to market, save R&D money, uh, enable reuse, this is also a keyword, a buzzword that is used over the last decades. I've heard it yeah, every five years it's coming up and then going down again. I believe this is a really a key enabler for reuse if you go this way. <clears throat> However, there are some mandatory prerequisites. So I fully believe we need a standardized open source framework and Mosaic could be one way to go. Uh, which allows simple installation and is open for different design tasks or modules. Um, so uh, we believe uh, it should be able with with uh, with uh, little effort to include uh, other generators like BAG or Align uh, into this this framework. This is one of the goals. There shall be a stable and efficient well-maintained flow. This is still a lot of work to, to do here. If you think about the implementation side, the IP building blocks, not every building block is, is well suited to be coded. Uh, you should be aware of that. So a careful choice of use cases shall be done, especially in, in a beginning phase. In the end, it only pays off if you follow an IP platform approach, as explained with, with the timeline slides I've shown you. And yeah, also mentioned several times, uh, skill set and mindset is really crucial. Uh, in German, we say uh, you cannot force, how do you say, man kann den Hund nicht zum Jagen tragen. You, you would not carry a dog to go hunting. So we have to look for people that are ambitious and believe in this and are open, open minded to learn new skills and follow this approach. And I see there are a lot of people that really 
get excited and like it. And uh, so I'm I'm very optimistic about uh, yeah the next steps here. And I'm also very curious how this whole story will end up. And by this, I conclude my talk. And yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions. OK, great, thanks. Thanks, Christoph. So since I have an opportunity to ask Christoph a lot of things, I, I would <laughs> like you to take uh, the chance because we have a common project. So uh, I would like you to take the chance and ask him whatever, you know, uh is you know of your interest whether it is presentation or maybe some other question of this specific topic thanks yeah it seems everybody are shy <laughs> <laughs> so uh christoph then i will i will, I will start i will start okay sure. so um you know, regarding the standardization, which you which you mentioned mm -hmm. here, standardized open source framework, etc. I mean, uh, uh, Florian will present tomorrow uh, the idea of the framework itself, and yeah. that is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, see the the standardization process? Because mm -hmm. I'm asking specifically because big companies they usually kind of come together and they do a lot of paperwork and proclaim the standard. If I understand mm -hmm. correctly, that's the way to go. But open source community is is doing it through the commits. Mm -hmm. So since this is open source framework, you know, what is your take on this topic? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, excellent question. <laughs> um, yes, as, as you mentioned, th there are two ways how to standardize things. Usually, so one is going through, for example, so you, you you join in or you yeah, you join an IEEE standardization team or you have to found a new one. And then you find enough partners that are relevant key players in this field and then together you define a standard, which is then a, a real standard. Uh, in, in, in our case, we 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 did. We decided not to go this this way because uh, Infineon is is not an EDA vendor, and we are discussing here uh, basically EDA tooling and how to use it, and how to do the work. And this is not a. I mean, it's very relevant and important for Infineon, but it's not our our core business. I would say so we, don't, we don't make money with that, and that's. I mean, that's a bit my personal opinion. I also have to say this. Uh, um, that's the reason why we, we decided not to go this approach. Um, and the second approach is, and what what we what we do now here is, uh, to achieve a quasi standardization by uh, getting uh, releasing uh, this framework open source and try to catch interest of people that uh, should have interest in, in using that and convince these people that they get a benefit when, use, when using this framework. And by doing so, achieving a broader, a growing, growing the community. And uh, once uh, we should achieve a point where uh, a lot of people are using it and then it, it is a quasi standard established. That's what I mean here with, with standardization. So it's not it's not a real standard like you. You get an official stamp on it. So in open source, it's it's different. You have to trust that you what you release open source is really of of help and and of use for the community and that people are using it. Of course, there is no guarantee that this will happen. But I said I'm an I'm an optimist, so I believe we have a very good pro solution proposal here on the table. And uh, this bootcamp here, the task or well, one goal for me is, is uh, also now to have a first test on this framework. If the, so my wish would be that people take it and use it and and we get a lot of feedback so it, because it will not be perfect. That's that's clear. But to get feedback, how to improve it, and also to get uh, honest feedback about if this is a good approach or if this is a not useful approach. This would also be, of course, important for us to know, because then we need to change a strategy here. 
Mm. But yeah, I'm convinced that it's a good approach. OK, thanks. Uh, anybody else would like to ask Christoph something? <laughs> I have a list of questions, but you know, that's not the <laughs> point. Please, can somebody ask, you know, Christoph? Uh, about the presentation. OK, then Christoph, me again. So you presented, you know, before the slide oh, where you had. Oh, OK, please. Somebody uh, from the audience, maybe. There was one. There is one question from the audience here. Excellent. Can please down, shoot. <laughs> maybe it's just this microphone here. Oh, OK. okay. Hi, Christoph. Uh, oh. I don't know. Oh, can they see? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can see you. Please introduce okay, yourself. You yeah. Okay. Hi, Christoph. My name is Ryan. So I'm one of the guests here visiting. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, nice talk, by the way. I like it. A uh, quick question. Um, how do you think this will change how universities teach analog design? Because, you know, the way we are usually mm -hmm. taught analog down to the very basics as a transistor, you do small signal analysis and stuff like that. But I believe if you teach it immediately in the university and when they get out, once they graduate, it will be easier to, how would you call it, assimilate this uh, um, uh, analog generator frameworks to some other companies because they have that skill set already. So I mean, like they have an exactly. idea how to. Mm -hmm. Yes, again, very good point you touch here. So. I believe this is also really crucial and another good reason why going the open source approach and not not the IEEE standardization way. Because, I mean, we see already it's much easier than to, to involve uh, universities into using the same uh, procedures or the same framework, however you want to call it. Uh, and, and Berkeley is demonstrating this quite successfully already, and there are other universities that do this as well. And I think that's really crucial that uh, students today already see in their, let's say, in at least latest in their master courses, that there are different ways how to design an analog circuit. So I've heard from from some some students that uh, Elad Alon is is in his in his basic uh, circuit design courses. He is uh, showing. He is explaining to them the the back approach, um, and he's they are really using it in their classes, and also in in homework. So they the people get used to it. Uh, they they understand or they they get taught how to use it efficiently. And then when, when when they graduate, it's it's not something completely new to them. And this, I think, is it will take years probably that uh, this will be established also on on many more universities. But you need you need to start somewhere, and that's I believe crucial to get broad usage as well and broad acceptance <clears throat> and to to support this mindset change for electrical engineers especially. And Maybe another aspect, uh, a lot of universities see a trend that students prefer uh, to go for uh, computer science and not for electrical engineering. And this might maybe be a way to gain back some, some of the students that they lost to the computer science. Of course, maybe for them it makes the, the job then also more interesting. They can, can do more coding here. All right, thank you, Christoph. Thank you. OK, great. Thanks, Ryan. Anybody else from the call would like to ask Christoph? <laughs> OK, everybody are quiet. We still have some Hello. nine minutes. OK, Achilles is, is stepping up. Thanks, Achilles. Oh, um, this presentation, Christoph, was very interesting. Um, I been researching about tools uh, that are uh, a tool that is very similar to this is open facebook i don't know if you know something about that uh, when i see the, the design flow that turns a, a specification into the, the the design and i think that that's very similar i don't know what 
it's like the uh, difference. But what are the, the difference? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm aware of open FASOC and uh, it's it's one of the, the valid approaches that, that universities kicked off and, and follow. And so uh, today, I mean, I mentioned back several times because this was the first uh, generator tooling tool environment we, we started to use, but we, we also have uh, looked to others. So I, today I would not prefer one over the other. And there are certain advantages and disadvantages of all these approaches that are available today. Um, so it is to me, it is not clear what or uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there is not one where I would say this is now the best approach. And what we try here now with with this framework initiative is to. To uh, define the or to, to, to get certain standards in place that allows you to in the ideal case also to mix parts of, of the different approaches um, so that you can choose the best uh, uh, tool or the best tool for your design task for example it could be that uh, within bag they already have uh, nice uh, circuit optimizers included but the layout engine is, is quite tricky to use and a lot of effort. And then maybe in Open FASOC you have already a much better layout engine. And then you, you might want to use both in the same environment. And this is not definitely not possible today. But this is something where with, with this framework that, that we have defined now, at least we, we, we want to take a first step to this towards this direction that allows to use to, um, to mix different approaches within your design that you can choose the best one for, for your needs. That's a vision and I, I'm, I'm fully aware we are still far away from that. This is uh, smoothly working, but yeah, it's the first step we take. Yeah, it seems that they are, they are also struggling with the layout generation. Yeah, but thanks mm -hmm. Christoph. Yeah, layout is definitely the biggest pain point to buy today, in my opinion. Um, yeah, because it's a lot of manual work to do the layout, code it, and yeah. On the other hand, there is, there is no good, in my opinion, there is no, no good EDA tool solution for automatic place and route for unlock on the market today. Yeah, so still a good arena for universities to do some research. Uh, hello, I, I also have a question. Um, thanks for the talk. Um, I saw that the vision earlier, or I don't know if um, that was uh, already reality in terms of the, um, say, a process that you've already made for the analog generator, but um, there was a part there where um, the, the um, expected uh, work overhead of the um, analog uh, coding, the analog generator is placed beside um, the IP, right? So um, it's IP with the coding overhead, and then there's derivatives of it. And then when you need to port it to another technology, uh, or to another process, um, to another process node, um, then uh, the work is already saved for you by the coding itself. But um, in mm -hmm. reality, um, uh, there is uh, there seems to be like coding overhead as well um, in terms of like the current generators, right? Um, and there seems to be a little bit of coding overhead depending on um, what uh, foundry you have or uh, what like um, process design kit that you're using and uh, um, the technology knows because there's always like subtle differences in the uh, in the layout specifications of each of those um, foundries. So um, how do you think um, the like how do you think this uh, this like the software or the um, the framework will uh, will solve that eventually um, because it, it seems to me right now that um, it, it feels like fabrication will have to change in such a way that they will also need to agree with each other uh, on these certain things that um, so that the layout generator can uh, expect certain things out of the um, out of the uh, process design kits and the foundries. Um, 
so that uh, it doesn't have to, the code doesn't always have to change whenever you um, try to uh, port something to a new um, technology. Mm -hmm. Yes, so that's that's again a, a one of the pain points that you touch here. <laughs> that is definitely true that if you want to do it the technology porting, then in layout there are a lot of uh, specific things you have to take into account. And if you do need to do this in coding, it's it's uh, might also be tricky. However, so that that's in in back. They already demonstrated that they can do with little effort technology porting even between FinFET and Bulk CMOS. So it is doable as long as you don't uh, completely change your, your topology, of course. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, this is something that really um, a lot of effort shall be still spent to get to a te uh, technology agnostic PDK approach. That's how I would call it. Um, so what, what I mean with this is that in the ideal case, you should be able to code your IP block uh, independent of, of what technology you use in the end. I mean, this will never be fully achieved, but this, yeah, at least partly we, we, sh we should be able to get there, uh, especially if, if you stay with, within uh, a type of technology, let's say you stay in, in bulk CMOS, then it should not be, or, or the code for the generator should not have any dependencies, whether you, you would then target a 28 nanometer or 22 or, or, or a 65 nanometer CMOS technology. But we are not there today, yes. So. I see. Um, follow up question. Do you think the analog generators could achieve that? Um, regardless of the wishes of the um, uh, foundries, for example, could we find like uh, a workaround where we could always like dig into um, whatever um, whatever uh, PDK they had given us and uh, say parse things from there in the code? Mm. Yeah, I mean, that, that's still uh, yeah, a, a problem today. Uh, so first problem is it's, it's not easy to get access to foundry PDKs. It's, it's usually confidential data um, for reasons I, I understand, of course. Uh, on the other hand, each foundry prepares the data in a different way. And yeah, so this is not, not there is not a straightforward solution today. And um, I mean, we are already looking into solving that. I know it's Al Carsten, for example, spent already quite some effort uh, into analyzing how how to solve this or and yeah but yeah still a lot of work to be done here yes i have no solution ready today <laughs> i have to say thank you um uh, christoph i know that you don't have that much time but i think uh tomislav markovic has a question for you yeah sure okay can you hear me yes hello Hello. Well, first of all, thank you for the one hour talk, motivating talk. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, I'm Tomislav. I'm from the University of Zagreb and uh, KU Leuven, so two affiliations. And I'm, I'm actually quite interested in this topic. And my, my question is, well, you, you do talk about what should be done and what can be done. Mm -hmm. And then you talk about that we need more students to work on that and me being professor and I would if I would like to teach that, what would be your take on how would you start teaching that at a third year bachelor's to students who just have, you know, passed electronics, they know basic basics of uh, analog design? Mm -hmm. How would you start teaching? I see that there are people at Berkeley doing that, but of course yep. they get the best students in the world. <laughs> well, you know, well, these, these are just facts, but if you have to teach yep. that to an average student, yeah, how how would you do it? Could I could I get your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, my opinion is it it can be done, or it I believe it would make sense also to start teaching it already in a, a bachelor, third or fourth year, or uh, sorry, third year, um, because I believe what what you need to teach in such a class is is not. Uh, uh, details of, of how to design the latest and greatest ADC, but you need to teach how to apply, how to use the tooling 
how to do the coding. And here you can uh, use simple uh, circuit examples that you already have teached uh, in a previous lesson, like how how, to, how an op-amp works. It's a classical uh, mm -hmm. yeah, use case or, or a voltage regulator. This is what, what we usually take. <clears throat> and then uh, the students know already the circuit. They understand the circuit. And then in the second step, uh, you can teach them how now to automatize the, the, the different steps, design steps. Yeah. Two minutes. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm convinced it can be done and I'm not sure, but it could be. So since Berkeley open sources everything. So one, one prerequisite is that you have uh, a working tool base available that you can install simply and also the students can install simply. This is where we still need to put effort in. Yeah, so this is not not available today, but in Berkeley, for example, um, yeah, it might be possible that you, you get access to the to the teaching slides of Elad Alon, for example, mm -hmm. that you can, can get an idea how, how they do it. So yeah, I, I believe it can be done. Okay. And it, it definitely makes sense, especially also to make the students aware of that, that there is there are also different ways how to do analog design. So it's it's basically about seeding the seed and exactly. well, giving and, and giving them the flavor of the tool that could be later on leveraged on yeah, yeah. More. okay exactly and then if they later go to to another university or to industry then they already have heard about it they know basic stuff how to do it they are not surprised <laughs> and okay. yeah and it, it does not really matter if if you teach them the Berkeley analog generator or open or or align or whatever or or your own flavor I think it's important that they get the first idea okay yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I would be very happy if you start joining us here. <laughs> well, that is the idea. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank well. you. Uh, yeah. Step out now. Sorry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. In case there are any more questions, please send it to me and I will forward to yeah. Christoph and Chris for, and then you will hear from him. Regarding this talk, I will try, I need to work on creating a YouTube channel or something where people can actually have access to the recordings. And yeah, stay tuned. I hope there will be more interesting talks to come, but also if you want to work in the in this arena, there will be like some onboarding. I think it's a great time for you to jump on this boat. Yeah. Thank you all for your time. And we hear each other hopefully soon. Okay. Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>